there's nothing really to be proud of in terms of the G7's uh, progress since uh, since Glen Eagles. They said they were going to make trade work for Africa. That was a pretty vague commitment, and um, perhaps that's one reason they haven't haven't done very much. But even by the things they wanted to be measured by, uh, there's not so much to show for it. And we have something to say about what what's needed um, moving ahead. Uh, just a particular snapshot on Canada, which I know will interest everyone. Uh, I would say it's a good news, bad news story. The good news is uh, Canada has uh, vastly exceeded the commitment it made, and it was a revised commitment not long after Glen Eagles met it by 170 percent of the target. Uh, the not so great news is it was a pretty modest goal, and I'll say that's also true about Japan and the U.S. They didn't make the most ambitious goals, and they have exceeded them. Uh, extremely ambitious goals were made by the UK, and they've just about met it. That, in 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 terms of dollar terms, by far the boldest commitment. Um, the French, the Italians, uh, and the Germans made bold commitments and have come up short. I already mentioned Italy, uh, but on Canada in particular, they made a modest commitment and have exceeded it. Um, and the exceeding it is good news. The troubling uh, twist, I would say, is that the current uh, recent development of uh, flatlining funding for development moving forward from 2010, 2011, over the next five years is, uh, is troubling and hard to square with the enthusiasm around the maternal and child health initiative that Canada is launching at the G8 and trying to galvanize support for. Uh, final thing, I think I've probably spoken too much, but the last thing I'll say is that lessons from this um, is that there really are results and uh, uh, that, that, that can be linked to effective aid, all aid, uh, is not effective, and historically, there are lots of examples of bad aid, but over the last 10 years, uh, those who uh, focus on aid have found ways to make it much more effective. We know a lot more about what makes aid work, and that's what's yielded the results I described a second ago. Um, the second thing is the importance of accountability, and I want to praise Canada for, for making accountability the top agenda item or a top agenda item for the upcoming G8. It really matters that you be able to specify the commitments that are made so that you can track them and, and see what the results are. We actually do believe this formula of a collective commitment uh, makes a difference. If you had just not had a Glen Eagles and counted on the seven countries to kind of do their best, uh, we are absolutely confident that if you aggregated the uh, increases that they wouldn't total anywhere near $13.7 billion. So there's a lot to be said for that, that framework and that approach where pressure is applied and there's some mutual accountability, but we think accountability needs to be tightened up. Um, and then the last point I'll make uh, is that this, we've talked about this as the end of a chapter, uh, the fifth year of the Glen Eagles commitments, but it's really not the end of the story. It's the beginning or, or a turning point. Um, to the future, especially because we know what works, and especially because of some of the things that are on the horizon, like the MDG Summit. Canada plays an absolutely critical role here. Its leadership of the G8 and the G20 uh, will can, can really determine where the rich donor countries go on all this. And I should um, say, I mentioned the, the worrisome development on spending, but if you go back we're talking about this as the Glen Eagles commitments that came in 2005, and Tony Blair and the other leaders at the time deserve a lot of credit. In many ways, the stage was set at Kananaskis in 2002 when, when Canada hosted the G8, um, and they created an Africa action plan that was bold and that, uh, that gained momentum and then fed into Glen Eagles, and that the commitments we're talking about today that have made such a, a big difference, you could really trace back to Canada's leadership, and uh, I want to suggest, and, here with Canadians, that uh, this is a, a great opportunity for Canada to uh, re-energize the effort and uh, relaunch the effort and show leadership that will that will uh, continue the progress that's been made. So thank you very much. Sorry for going on so long. Thanks very much, David. Um, next, just let me introduce in a few words um, uh, Yasmin Warsami. Um, for those of you who watch, have a television, turn it on, you'll know exactly who she is um, uh, on the CTV television network, not to, uh, not to uh, um, choose any network over another. But Yasmin uh, comes uh, to that from a tremendously successful uh, 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 career in the fashion industry. She's worked with uh, 
uh, the, the iconic names in the fashion industry. If you saw them, they're like a, sort of a, a who's who of, of designers. Uh, she's appeared in Vogue. She's appeared in Elle magazine multiple times. She uh, uh, leads the advertising campaigns for many of the most iconic brands uh, 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 in the global marketplace. Um, most importantly, however, I, I think, um, uh, born in Somalia, came to Canada when she was 15, Yasmin, and uh, uh, a leading member of the Somali Canadian community. And uh, having spoken to her for some time this morning, I would say a very proud Canadian. So, Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so I guess I can't really add any more into that lovely introduction. <laughs> Thank you. I can, I offer catwalks, anyone's interested. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, as, um, as Mark said, I, I'm, I'm born in Somalia. I was born in Somalia and I've immigrated to Canada. I've grown up, uh, most of my uh, growing up was done in Western world. Um, to some extent, I think in Western terms. Um, I went back to Somalia after 20 years of being absent from, from Somalia and I felt um, it, it, was, it was welcoming. But at the same time, I felt a bit of a foreigner to, to some extent. Um, now, um, I'd like to thank uh, an organization like, uh, like ONE for, for, for shining a light into, this, into these concerns and these uh, um, many different issues that Africa has been dealt with, Africa has. One of my personal experience uh, going to Somalia has um, has left me with an impression that when I come back to Canada, I'm not, I can't just sleep and, and let, let it be. I, uh, even though Africa's issues seem sometimes a bit overwhelming um, to, to, to us Westerners, because it seems like it's, we, we can't handle it, we can't solve all of the issues politically. Uh, there's just so much to, to, to when, you, when, you, when you read about it, when you see it on TV, there's, it's, it seems really overwhelming. And, but um, but when I went there, it it had a different effect on me. I came back with a sense that said, though it, you might not be able to fix all of the issues, at least try to do what I can on my part. Um, I'm very glad to have partnered with one and uh, and also an uh, an organization called the African Future, which um, works on trying to. Uh, supply medical equipment to um, local communities in Somalia. It's a, it's a small step, but it's a step. And um, I guess being, um, I guess there's, there's one thing, I, if there's one thing that I've learned more than anything is that there's a, Africa has two faces. The one that we see on TV, the one that is always in need, the one you know with, that shows us advertisement of kids with big bellies and flies on their faces, and then there's a different Africa. There's the beautiful Africa. There's the vibrant Africa. There's the um, the Africa that though might they might not know what their next meal is going to be, laugh from a place that I don't see English people or Canadian people laugh from sometimes. Such happiness, um, and I think it would be an incredible thing if we can media-wise and, and national, you know, uh, if we can introduce the other face of Africa to people so that it may allow such, uh, uh, you know, uh, programs as one to, uh, and, and allow the rest, Canada, for example, which has, I'm very proud of uh, in its involvement in, uh, in the G8 and how, how, it, how it has uh, kept up its commitment. Very proud to be Canadian. But, I think it would allow a lot. It would it would allow a lot of. It would give a lot of people the, um, the courage and the and the um, I guess the desire to want to be involved more in Africa. It won't seem so scary and so needy and you know. And I think a lot of us that have visited Africa has gotten to see that on first hand. But I wish we would uh, shine a light on the second part of the second face of Africa. That's great. Um, I'm very proud to be African, I'm very proud to be Canadian, and I hope um, with, with uh, organizations like one that um, we, we will, we will uh, further our involvement and our, co you know, uh, color um, our combined experiences with Africa, and hopefully it'll be a place where we can invest and a place where we can feel um, conf confident to 
to go and to invest and to be part of it.